Genetic bioengineering is not something unfamiliar in the Rain World universe. Today, we will be covering four of the many possible hybrids between all the slug cats, both vanilla and downpour, covering the possible abilities, struggles, mutations, and destinations of each of them. Spit, fecal matter, skin cells, blood samples, all sorts of ways to acquire the necessary data. Do not try this at home, at least get a PhD first. Which I don't have either, but don't worry about that, it doesn't matter. Now let's read over these case logs. Taking the two combat efficient rodents into play here, we can increase the percentage of feral but tactical self-defense. Both are equally capable of handling themselves when ambushed. The pre-instituted mutations of the Spearmaster and the nuclear aggression of the Artificer makes this experiment very volatile. There have been several failed attempts, but one has finally fought its way into living. Records dub this success as the Hellion. Description states as follows. The Hellion's body could hardly hold proper structure during cellular construction. Stitches had to be constantly maintained throughout the whole process. As a result, the Hellion has scar tissue all around the mouth and trailing down the stomach. Similar to the Spearmaster, the mouth could not be provided. However, it was instead due to the constant flow of toxic smoke that would continuously vent out of the throat in through the nostrils and mouth. Additionally due to this, the feeding process akin to the Spearmaster had to also be replicated. The spears are considerably thinner now, more akin to needles. Upon being inserted into the flesh, and once energy is absorbed, the needles will promptly detonate. The attributes of the artificer are maintained. Alongside the explosive needles, the ability to double jump is still possible. The small bud at the tip of the tail acts as an exhaust. The toxic smoke, as stated earlier, builds up in the bud and can be ignited to create a small explosion which thrusts the hellion forward into the air. Overusing this function can result in the hellion's needles erupting out of its tail, shooting in every which direction, additionally stunning the rodent temporarily. Mauling is no longer an option given the lack of mouth, but that didn't stop it. While mauling may not be an option, shredding is. Shredding can be defined as it forcefully rolling into an object or enemy, causing minimal damage. This does, however, require close contact and may not always be efficient. A recent experiment was also conducted to test the Hellions' ability to hold their breath underwater. This test did not last long, as only four seconds went by before the Hellion promptly exploded into a cloud of meat and gas. A notable observation is that bubbles quickly stemmed out of the orifices of the slug cat's tail once it made contact with the water. The gas has been observed to choke other creatures in the surrounding area of bubbles. Regardless, liquid environments are not probable for survival. Several prototypes of the Hellion have been created, the majority of which have detonated during cellular production. Only one has survived the total process, and is being relocated to the eastern memory crypts for total obliteration and pollution. This bioweapon is complete. Mission is successful. We're moving on to the next one. A rare specimen that has not been shared with the local group is the collection of this forgotten slug cat. Splicing with this strange foreign wet mouse has had a rather successful evolution overall. The cloning process will be extremely simple, to my relief. This experiment will be dubbed the Hadel. While cellular construction was rather simple, it was quite messy. The creature excretes this mucus ooze out of slime glands located all over its body. I have yet to find a counterbalance for this. Regardless, it is what I intended. The Hadel's eyes are extremely large and much more sensitive to light. Night vision is concluded to be an attribute. Tests have confirmed it is able to track objects through heat difference, as well as sharing 16 types of color photoreceptors. Dietary functions have expressed that the Hadel is to only consume plant matter and other smaller insects. The Hadel's body must remain at a constant moisture. Because of this, I have edited the lung's capacity, so the creature breathes naturally through its skin. The longest breath limit underwater that has been recorded so far has been 48 hours. The aquifers of the Western Group are a desirable location for this creature to be relocated, and traversing through it may prove no difficulty. The mucus, as stated before, excretes naturally. However, it has been shown to produce an increased level of slime when threatened or attacked. When tested in a close encounter with a particularly hungry reptilian, the Hadel began to dispose heavy amounts of slime when physically confronted. This mucus began to track down the reptilian's throat, which eventually choked the animal. When this experiment was done continuously, a quarter of the lizards had suffocated to death upon the oozing entering their esophagus. Further research records the ooze to be a salt, mucus, and sulfur solution. This experiment was successful. 
Overall testimonies, the Hadal and many others will be released into the western and southern iterator aquifers to saturate pipe structures with the mucus, which will eventually deteriorate and suffocate their water supply. Bioweapon complete. Mission successful here. Moving on to the next one. Code was stripped from both of the relating mammals, therefore only one was truly necessary considering their close blood relation. The combination of these two and this absurdly obese specimen took many cycles to finally grow. Over what feels like months, I have finally produced an absurdly oversized creature. I have dubbed it the Ark for the time being. An anomaly was first discovered during cellular construction. I had returned to this project after an unrelated disaster. The specimen had begun to grow, stems of DNA branching out of its flesh, no more than excess skin at the time. Once fully evolved, this creature is able to conduct asexual reproduction, creating more infantile clones of itself. An experiment was in order. Once left alone for 48 hours, I had returned to 20 pups surrounding the Ark. Each spawn shared the exact same DNA strands of each other and the Ark. No differences or faulties in between any of them. Due to this spontaneous self-cloning, the Ark should be placed under constant moderation when held in stasis. Unwanted child spawn will be disposed of or placed into harvesting. Otherwise, continue as before. Let it be known that the dietary functions of this abomination are abysmal. It is omnivorous and has consumed everything edible for that of its species. A more detailed examination is catalogued, as it has been seen eating other abnormal vegetation and the occasional synthetic material. Out of curiosity, a test of starvation had been conducted, and it is confirmed it will eat its own child spawn if necessary. Durability examination proves the following. The Ark has four layers of skin, all wrapping a very condensed multi-segment of fat. When it begins to reproduce, the first two layers of the slug pustulate and then break to reveal the third layer, which the satelliting cells begin to grow out of. Additionally, because of these several layers of fat and skin, paired with these fast working cells, withstanding injuries against jawed or spiked creatures is highly plausible. Consistent effort, however, does still lead in eventual death. High resistance to disease, pressure, and impact are cataloged. This creature still suffers from all other standing death tolls. Despite this creature's lumbering appearance and gluttonous attunement, mental evaluation proves the specimen is beyond the base level of intelligence. The Ark has provided understanding towards machinery that should not even be possible for its, what I assume to be, limited education. Perhaps the malfunction I mentioned in earlier paragraphs was not entirely unrelated to its development. Continuing on, cranial evaluation provides evidence of this creature's increase in intense neuropathways. I'm sure if I did not already have plans for this beast, it could be used as a susceptible battery with the level of electron reactions that set off in its lobes. In any case, overall testimonies, the Ark's erratic reproductive methods that occur at a rapid rate has proven to use a unique tactic I've dubbed Invasive Population Bomb. Only one arc has been successfully grown. Over long periods of time, more will come. Considering how rapid it is growing, the arc is being sent to the southernmost region immediately. Bioweapon complete, mission successful. Moving on to the last one. Potentially the most difficult experiment of my time. Gathering genetic code sampled from the hunter was rather simple, albeit very dangerous to my equipment. However, gathering data from this unique case was exceedingly difficult, and had resulted in specific mechanisms that I have yet to reveal to any and all outside eyes. It will be kept to myself until I eventually rot away like the others. Regardless, data collection was a success. However, the stability of the specimen was not. Seven prototypes had been created, all of which died before I could even engage in the final growth cycle. At a last effort, and with the limited data that I had left, the introduction of a void solution was injected into the final project's bloodstream. To my conclusion, this did indeed work to save the specimen from perishing like I hypothesized. Just not the way I intended it to work. The creature is stuck in a paradoxical limbo of life and death but all physical examinations detect that states of rigor mortis have occurred long ago. Its cells are dying, but it seemingly never starts or ends. Endangerment does not cause an FOF response. Damage to the flesh causes a reaction of black arms to wrap and protrude out of the womb, 
poison, suffocation, pressure difference, subjugated neural failure, infections, tensity, acceleration, hypothermia, hyperthermia, laceration, bloodletting, detonation, heart failure, inverted flesh, many others that I can't even be bothered to document. This specimen has shown immune durability to every potential lethal subjection I could possibly offer. The internal disease that infested its flesh was somehow stuck in an infinite case of decay while the liquid injection was keeping it alive. Lesser examinations document the specimen has proven to react to my words despite me having no recollection of allowing it a mark of communications. The longer I am allowing myself to research this paradox, it produces a corrosive confusion in my systems, but it may provide knowledge to understanding this problem that we all face. However, with how they have reacted to my previous contributions, they don't deserve my knowledge if they are to be so ungrateful. Despite all my best attempts to provide a secure and steeled facility, this experiment is no longer in my possession. Where it may be, I could not provide a confident conclusion. Suggestions detail a possible route towards the depths of the Earth, assuming this is true. It is a priority that I must find and relocate the specimen before it is revealed to the local group. It is not ready. I have to find it. There's no telling what they could steal from me.